What can you, as a recreational aviator, learn from SpaceX? It is called scenario thinking, and it's a method that I've been using with great success for over two decades now. And it helps you change from this, oh my god, what's happening, into, yeah, that was to be expected. Welcome to Flight Coach, my name is Bas van Duin and it is my mission to help you get more out of life and your flying career through having less stress and more skills. Today's episode is the third installment in my series, Responsible Risk Taking. If you have not seen the previous episode first, I recommend that you do that. I will leave a link right here. In this episode, you're going to learn a method that's called scenario thinking to be more responsible in your risk taking. We're going to kick right off with an example. And before I explain in more detail how this can relate to your flying, just bear with me, open your mind to the beautiful world of rocket science. Now, of course you don't know this about me, but I'm a huge space fan. For me, it's very normal to set my alarm in the middle of the night to watch a rocket launch. Just recently, on May 30th, SpaceX became the first commercial company ever to launch two astronauts to the International Space Station, a huge achievement. These are really exciting times we live in. Let's take a look at how SpaceX does scenario thinking. Take a look at this image. And this image shows the vehicle's planned trajectory into orbit. But they realize even though, or maybe because it is rocket science, things may go wrong. Rockets sometimes explode and generally that's bad for the health of the occupants. And of course they want to keep the crew safe. Now they have an option to jettison the crew capsule from the rest of the rocket if things go wrong. They then use the capsule's rocket engines to fly to a proper spot. This capsule is designed to land in water and it's aided by parachutes. Sound familiar? And after that it is to be picked up by the rescue ships that are standing by. So how do they go about this? Well depending on what time in the launch they are, they have different modes to abort. And an abort means getting away from the rocket that is about to explode. So if you listen to old Apollo footage that has been broadcasted for over decades, you can sometimes hear the call out mode one Bravo or something similar. That's not just a guy trying to be cool on the radio. It actually means something. And this abort can be done in all stages of the flight right up until orbit. They, they can do this on the pad, which is situated in Cape Canaveral in Florida. They call it the pad abort. And here you see some footage of this being tested for vehicle certification. And also in mid-flight, it works the same. You disconnect from the rocket, you power up the capsule's engines and you fly away and you choose a spot to ditch. Now let's look at the path again. If you abort somewhere in this green zone, you just fly away from the rocket and land somewhere along the coast. Right up until this first circle. When they enter this circle, they have to actively decelerate to prevent ending up in the red zone. In this red zone, it is very difficult to do retrieval because of wild seas, cold water, and the difficulty for rescue ships to come over there. So if something happens in this zone, they accelerate until they reach Ireland to ditch over there. And there's another circle, as you may see. If something goes wrong in this circle, they have to decelerate to stay in this zone. And if it goes wrong after this zone, they would come down somewhere over continental Europe. And as you can see, it's red again there. So then they have to make a decision to accelerate and they do this into orbit. Since they're already going so fast and they're really high, they have all the time to sort things out in orbit and to get back into the atmosphere and land at a location of their choosing. So when we zoom in and we start talking about risks, what are they actually doing? These abort modes are actually predefined scenarios and they're used to prevent having to think about what to do when the shit hits the fan. Now let's take a look at how this process would play out if they had not made these scenarios and they have to make it all up as they go along. I imagine it would look something like this. The system says the rocket is going to blow up. Oh, that's not good. I agree. Shall we abort? Oh, that's a great idea. But where do we point the capsule? Where are we anyway? I don't know. <laughs> We're not in space yet. Right. Let's take a look at the map. Okay. Yeah, I think we're here now. Um, but if we abort now, we're going to end up in the middle of the ocean. 
Ooh, I don't know. I heard it's pretty cold down there on Discovery Channel. Might not be a great spot. Indeed. Let's ask Mission Control. Houston, can we land in the middle of the ocean? No, no, you can't. Tell him it's very cold. It's very cold there. Okay, uh, so where do you want us to put her down then? So does this sound ridiculous to you? Then why are so many pilots dealing with risks in exactly this way? The baseline here is do as much of the thinking before the shit hits the fan so you have all the time to act when the shit hits the fan. Now I love surprises. On my birthday or maybe in the evening. But what I hate are surprises while flying. I don't want any. I've spoken to many pilots after incidents or near misses to evaluate what happened. And what I usually get is that they did not see this coming. But when asking further questions, if the situation that occurred was really that unlikely, I noticed that the problem is not that it was very hard to predict what happened, but that they did not think about it in the first place. They did not have this scenario thinking in place. And that's why I think it can be a very useful tool for you as well. So let's translate this scenario thinking that we saw in the SpaceX example to what we can experience in our daily flying life. So let's start with a paramotor example. You're flying over a forest and there are not many spots to land. Suddenly your engine starts sputtering. Now I can imagine, depending on the height that you are above the trees, that the way you deal with the situation can be quite different. If you're quite high, you'll probably take some time to check what's going on if it's just a temporary issue or that you really need to set her down. If you're low over the trees, you may need to decide to land in a tree right away. And if you're somewhere in between, it's very good to look for clearings in the woods to go land. And I recommend flying low, either with your paramotor or with your normal paraglider, you're always aware what the different landing possibilities within your glide ratio are. Preferably always have a primary landing spot and a secondary one. When I'm flying cross country and I'm getting low, I'm always thinking like this. If I bum out of the thermal now, what will be my preferable, my primary landing location? And if for some reason I get closer to that and it will not be suitable for landing, what is my alternate that I can still reach from there? By the way, I hope that you're noticing that I'm really enjoying creating this content. And I hope you are enjoying my content as well. A way you can help me if you appreciate my content is to smash that like button. That causes my videos to be shown to more people who then can also benefit from the channel. And a typical example often experienced in paragliding is you're flying along a ridge and you get a big collapse with a cravat. And it's not possible to land safely with that. You need to do something to fix it. Well, depending on your altitude, you should think of different scenarios. When you're very high, you might decide to first pull the tip line, then try a collapse. Maybe try a counter collapse, try big airs on both sides, then maybe try a full stall. And if all else fails, you can throw your reserve. If you're a lot lower, you probably only have time to try if you can get the cravat out while pulling the tip line. And if that doesn't work, you have to throw your reserve immediately because you don't have the time, eh, the height to solve the situation. You do not have the time to do all these things. And when you're even lower, like skimming the treetops, the only thing that you can do if you get a big collapse is just flare it out and hope for the best. And for those of you that do towing with the paraglider, you may have had the cable snap on you. Well, that can be quite a nasty experience, and especially if you're a tandem pilot. Well, we as tandem pilots are trained to deal with that according to different scenarios. When you're really low to the ground and the cable snaps, the only thing you can do is really break the glider to prevent it from overshooting and going head first into the ground, crashing on top of your passenger. But when you're a little higher, the response to the exact same thing happening is completely different. You let the glider dive. Of course, you check the dive by breaking the glider so it doesn't overshoot too much, but you check the dive and you allow yourself to swing under the glider and then come down in a relatively controlled manner. And if you're higher still, like let's say a few hundred meters above the ground and the cable breaks, you have all the time in the world 
to properly disconnect the cable, take it into your hand and drop it in a controlled location, fly a pattern and land normally. So these are three different ways to deal with the exact same situation, three different scenarios. And it is very important that you have these scenarios in your brain before you start flying. Another example, flying with other pilots. And this is a thing that's usually experienced as quite difficult scenario wise, because it can be hard to predict what others do. And you experience this when flying at a ridge, when flying in thermals, or maybe when flying in a traffic pattern coming in for landing. Let's take the last one as an example. But this goes for all situations where you're flying in relatively close proximity to other pilots. Now, for your own safety, assume that all the other pilots are suicidal maniacs that will find a way to end up in your flying line. Now, a few questions that you should think about. What if the wind shifts, if it changes direction? What if the wind speed suddenly changes? What will you do then? What will the other pilots do? Some people may change their approach direction earlier than you would. What if someone in front of you, halfway downwind, suddenly decide it would be a great idea to make an extra 360 to lose some altitude? Where is your escape in that case? Maybe the escape means that you decide not to land on this specific field. Because if things get hairy, if you keep focusing on that certain field, it will lead to tunnel vision and it won't be beneficial for your safety. So I hope that by showing you these examples, and of course you can think of thousands more, but I hope that by showing you these examples, you see that scenario thinking is more than just thinking ahead. Continuously, while you're flying, think about the things that may happen and how you would respond to them. This makes sure that you keep your brain space free for acting when needed. It structures your thinking so that you're not flying all the time like, oh, what's going to happen now? What's going to happen now? No, you structure your thinking so you're enjoying and relaxing more. So let's go over a few tips for proper scenario thinking and execution. Let's start with the situational awareness. Make sure that you know at all times what the wind direction is at the location you're flying. The direction and the speed. Make sure that you also know it for the locations you may end up. So make sure that you know it for over there and for over there. Of course, you cannot be 100% sure, but try to train your brain like this to have at least a broad picture of what the conditions are like. What other pilots are around me? What are they doing? And who should I watch out for more specifically? And now the positional awareness. How far away am I from the nearest obstacle below me? And how far away horizontally? Those other pilots, where are they going? What are they doing? Now, of course, these are not complete lists. If you have any additions, please leave them in the comments below. So the last thing you want when the shit gets real, yo, is trying to find out answers to these questions while you could have done that way before. So instead, choose the closest scenario. And remember, reality may be a bit different, but stick to the closest scenario and execute the solution you thought of. Now for the naysayers who do not believe in this strategy. You may think this won't work. I can't think of everything. I don't have enough experience. Well, experience does not really matter. If you've had your first 10 flights, it is actually quite easy to predict, if you take some time to think about it, to predict what is going to happen. Because especially when it comes down to the more difficult part, predicting what other people are gonna do, the way gliders go is determined mostly by two factors, the laws of physics and the decision that pilots make. And the laws of physics, they're the same for everyone. A paraglider has a certain speed and a certain direction it will not start moving diagonally with a speed of 500 kilometers per hour all of a sudden. It flies forward with a predictable speed or it stalls. The same goes for pilot behavior. There's a lot you can read in what other pilots do. And as you get more experience, you will undoubtedly get much better at this. This means that when you have less experience, you just have to increase your margins. Stay away further from other people until you're better at reading them. And of course, you don't have to think of everything. Nobody can do that. 
But training your mind to do this scenario thinking will actually improve your experience a lot. Just think of the things that could happen that would always warrant response A or that will always prevent you from doing B. And look for those signs. And another thing the naysayers might say is things will always go different than I expected them to. And yep, that is true to a certain extent. If you try to work with this mindset, if you incorporate scenario thinking into your flying, whatever it is that you're flying, hang glider, paraglider, paramotor, or maybe even a sailplane or general aviation, if you get into this mindset and make scenario thinking your own, make it something that you always incorporate into your flying, I can guarantee you, you will be a more relaxed, more controlled and happier pilot. You will see that a lot more than you thought before is actually quite predictable. Now I've been working with this scenario thinking method for over two decades and sometimes I still get surprised. But the big majority of cases, something happens and I can just think, yeah, I saw that coming. And that is something that I wish you to obtain for yourself as well. Please let me know in the comments down below what you think of this episode. Would you like to see more examples? Because in that case, I may make another episode specifically about that. Maybe you have some examples of your own. Feel free to share, would love to hear them. See you next time, see you in the air.